Welcome to On The Money Line, a podcast by MMA Play 365. I'm Newsom, and I'm here to break down UFC 291, a phenomenal pay-per-view event which goes down on Saturday night, headlined by the BMF baddest motherfucker title between Dustin Poirier versus Justin Gaethje, which is a rematch from a firefight that they had a few years ago. And in the co-main event, we've also got a fight where... I don't know whether the UFC are going to drop it on us on fight week that this is for the light heavyweight championship or not. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens there. Obviously, Jamal Hill has vacated the championship and there were rumours that this fight would be a championship fight. The UFC have said, no, it remains a three-round fight for now, which means that we might end up getting a light heavyweight championship. So again, that could get thrown into the works thrown into the public eye this week or it might not so it's interesting to see what's going to happen with that but all in all this is an amazing card on Saturday night I'm so excited to watch it I'm so excited to break it down my analysis is done my bets are in place so yeah super super excited for this weekend just before we get into those breakdowns though as always there's going to be a Bayes AI recap from last weekend's event at UFC London so if you are interested in AI and in the UFC prediction software, the AI that we have at MMA Play 365, then make sure you check out those Bayes AI recaps that we do, which is on the YouTube channel in a Bayes AI specific playlist, youtube.com forward slash MMA Play 365. But for now, let's get straight into the fights and we start with the main event, the BMF title. Who is going to be the baddest motherfucker? We've got Dustin Poirier versus Justin Gaethje too. And man, what a fight this is going to be. I actually think it's going to be a much better fight than we saw last time out. And what we did saw, what we did see last time out, sorry, is a fight where, you know, Justin Gaethje was landing hard low kicks, especially with Poirier being a southpaw fighter. I thought the low kicks might not be as available for Gaethje, but man, he battered that lead leg of Poirier. Poirier had to, you know, walk through some real tough strikes to end up getting himself the win. And Gaethje, like I say, he performed much better than I remembered. So when I went back and watched tape, I thought Gaethje was actually a lot better than I thought he was. But Poirier, again, he weathered the storm. He weathered those low kicks and he eventually just put the technical striking together, landed that shot that rocked Gaethje and that was the shot that Gaethje never recovered from. But what's interesting with this fight is I feel that both fighters have got better in different ways. So like with Justin Gaethje, he's not as wild and reckless as what he was when he fought Poirier last time. He's much more technical, he's got better fight IQ, he takes his time a little bit more as well, makes the good reads, but he's still an exciting fighter when it comes when it comes to it, he'll still stand there and throw down. Dustin Poirier, on the other hand, I still think is as skillful as what he was back then, but what I like about Poirier is he's spent more time inside the cage, he's more of a veteran now, I think he's more calculated, and I just feel that he's got a better head on his shoulders Yeah, I just like both fighters more now than what I did back then. So I think it's a real good fight now from a stylistic perspective. Again, it's going to be a fight, in my opinion, that's going to be back and forth. It's going to be competitive. The thing is, we're just engaging. And this is the thing that I can't really shake with him is, you know, you go back and watch that Fiziev fight. And man, like Fiziev is one of the best strikers in the entire division. I mean, some people might not know it yet. He might not have had a chance to prove it on a greater scale over multiple top fights in the division. But, you know, he's a former striking coach at Tiger Muay Thai, which says everything you need to know for a start. But he is in, he is an elite striker. And Justin Gaethje, he was the one that was hitting Fiziev with the hard shots. He was the one that was busting Fiziev up. Gaethje came out more or less without a scratch on his face. Fiziev was an absolute mess. So the fact that Fiziev's that much of an elite striker and Gaethje did that to him, I just feel that Gage's technical abilities are much better than I think people are giving him credit for. And Dustin Poirier, he's a very technical striker as well. So it's going to be an interesting chess match. I do think it's a fight that's going to be won and lost on the feet. I don't think, well, I do think, I do feel we might see a takedown or two more likely from Dustin Poirier's side, but the wrestling and the grappling, I don't think it's going to factor enough in this fight for the fight to be won and lost with the wrestling and grappling. I feel like the fight's definitely going to be won and lost with what happens on the feet. And again, I feel like 
Poirier is a fighter that's going to build into this fight. I think Gage is going to start the better, so I feel like Gage is going to take the earlier rounds. I think Poirier might come back into the fight late, should it go late, which, to be honest with you, they're both durable. I do anticipate it going, you know, at, at least into the third or fourth round, potentially to a decision. So... It's going to be a fight of two halves, in my opinion. I think Gage is going to start better. I think Poirier might come on stronger. And it's just going to be back and forth. I don't think that either fighter is going to absolutely run away with this fight. I think it's going to be super competitive. I do kind of feel that it's on Poirier to come back and win this fight a second time. I feel like he's the fighter that's more likely to pull throughout the two. But like I say, in a close and competitive fight that's going to have back and forth exchanges, maybe a bit of a war inside the cage as well. I feel that type of fight maybe favours Gaethje a little bit, but ultimately the fact it's going to be so competitive and I do feel it's going to be so close, I am going to be siding with what I normally do and that's the underdog in a fight that I believe is going to be as close to 50-50 as it gets. So I am going to be picking Justin Gaethje to win this fight and become the baddest motherfucker. And in the next fight, the co-main event, we've got Jan Blahovic versus Alex Pereira. Now, I'm going to be talking about this fight from a three-round non-title fight perspective because as of the time of recording the podcast, that's what we're getting. I kind of feel, though, that the if there is an extra couple of rounds in this fight, I don't think it makes too much of a difference to how the fight plays out. I feel like it would just be an extra couple of rounds. And that's if the fight even got that far, which, again, is you know, very questionable at this point. But look, from a stylistic perspective, I think it's very clear what's going to happen in this fight. From Jan Blachowicz's side, I feel he's got to wrestle. He's got to get a hold of Pereira, take him down, spend time on top. We saw what he did against Israel Adesanya when Adesanya stepped up in weight to fight Blachowicz. You know, he did get manhandled a little bit. From Pereira's side, I feel like keeping it on the feet, strike with Blachowicz and he knocks him out. So, from a stylistic perspective, it's a real intriguing fight. Now, from Alex Pereira's perspective, we've got to talk about this move up in weight now. This is a fighter that walks around at about 235 pounds. So the fact that he ever made 185 pounds or 186 pounds is just insane. And I cannot imagine how depleted his body was, how that factored on performances, cutting all that weight. The dude is just absolutely huge. So the fact that he now doesn't have to cut down to 185 pounds, he's got those extra 20 pounds on top of him and he can weigh in at 205. He doesn't have to cut the extra 20 pounds. He's going to have a much better weight cut. I feel his body's going to be much more of an optical performance type of body from the lack of the weight cut and the extra weight that he's allowed to carry. And I feel like this is going to be the best version of Alex Pereira that we are going to have seen in the UFC to date, which if I'm right, that's a scary proposition because he's looked good previously and he was the champion as well beating and knocking out Israel Adesanya so yeah I feel this is going to be the best version of Pereira Jan Blachowicz, how likely is he going to be able to wrestle and grapple Pereira well I actually think that Pereira is going to be heavier than Jan Blachowicz, even though he's the one moving up in weight he's going to be taller he's going to be longer I think he's going to be physically stronger so I kind of feel that Jan Blachowicz taking Pereira down might be a bit of a tough ask, and it's definitely going to be harder than Israel Adesanya. Like, when Adesanya went up in weight, he was definitely not the bigger, taller, stronger fighter. So, Jan Blachowicz taking Pereira down, it's going to be hard work. It's going to expend a lot of cardio, a lot of the gas tank, and if Blachowicz does get him down, does he finish Pereira on the mat, or does he waste a lot of energy getting him down? And maybe spends round, a round on top, but then when they get back up or start the next round, is he going to be tired? I kind of feel like the biggest gap in skill in this fight is absolutely with the striking. Yes, I feel the wrestling and grappling of Blahovic is his advantage over Pereira, but the striking advantage is just a much bigger gap in skill. Alex Pereira, I think, is going to be night and day, a better striker, more accurate, faster, powerful, more dynamic with the strikes, more variance with the strikes as well, using the kicks, the knees, the elbows. From a striking range perspective, I think Pereira will be better on the outside. I think he'll be better in boxing range. I think he'll be better in the clinch as well. So there's just a bigger gap in skill for Pereira. And for that reason, it's difficult to look past him, in my opinion, in this fight. Look, Blahovic has got a path to victory here with the wrestling and grappling. I'm just not sure he's able to do it 
for long enough periods in this fight or do it consistently over the course of the fight to be able to really pull away with the wrestling and grappling. I think Pereira's going to land punches on him. I think once Blahovic feels the power of Pereira, I think there might be some hesitancy that sets in. So there's a little bit of narrative that can set into play here. I ultimately just think that Pereira, it's his fight to win, in my opinion. So for those reasons, I'm picking Alex Pereira to win this fight. And in the next fight, we've got Tony Elkakui Ferguson versus Bobby Green. Now, this is a fight, look, I'd love to pick Tony Ferguson to win. He's been one of my favourite fighters for many, many years. And I imagine most MMA fans would say exactly the same thing as well. But the reality is the decline's huge. He hasn't won a fight since 2019, so we're talking four years. That's over the course of five fights. The last three opponents he beat was Donald Cerrone, Anthony Pettis, and Kevin Lee, all fighters that are no longer with the UFC. Obviously, Kevin Lee did make that reappearance a couple of weeks ago, but I think he's retiring now, maybe. So look, those three fighters are all fighters that have, you know, seemingly have retired. And again, that was a long, long time ago. And it's not as if Ferguson's been putting in the best performances. You can see the decline. It's so obvious. The durability, it's just not there too much anymore. The wrestling is just not there too much anymore. The grappling seems to, you know, not be there anymore. And it's really, it really sucks to talk about Tony Ferguson like this. But look, in in this sport, father time hits every fighter at some point and Look, in the prime, Tony Ferguson would have absolutely demolished Bobby Green, but it's just, we, we're we not going to see that version of Tony Ferguson. And look, he might be competitive in moments in this fight, but when all said and done, I think Bobby Green is definitely the more skilled fighter at this point in regards to being able to deliver inside the cage. I think he's going to be faster, a little bit more dynamic. I think the volume's going to be there in greater amounts. I think the wrestling could be there for Bobby Green. I just feel that Bobby Green at this point in his career against Ferguson at this point in Ferguson's career, Bobby Green is just going to be the better fighter wherever the fight goes. Durability, cardio, I think is on the side of Bobby Green as well. So yeah, look, I feel Tony Ferguson is going to have some moments in this fight, but I don't think it's going to be enough at this point to beat Bobby Green and I don't know whether it's going to be the last time we see Tony Ferguson inside the cage because, like I say, a five-fight skid over the last four years and the last three fighters you've beaten before that have all retired from MMA. It's, yeah, it's a tough one for Tony Ferguson. I think it's a good fight for Bobby Green. Bobby Green's fighting Tony Ferguson at the best possible time in Ferguson's career. So, for those reasons, I'm picking Bobby Green to win this fight. And in the next fight, this is a fun stylistic clash. We've got Michael Chiesa versus Kevin Holland. Now, Michael Chiesa, from his stylistic perspective, his advantages is going to be within the wrestling and grappling. More specifically, the grappling, though. I feel like if he does get Kevin Holland down, we're going to see a big difference in the grappling skill set. Even though Kevin Holland's a black belt and he's capable on the mat, Chiesa's just different. His positioning's so good. His transitions from position to position, good. He's able to recognise where he's got a solid position that his opponent's going to struggle to escape or improve their position from and just sit there. He'll land strikes. He'll look for submissions. He'll always be looking to take that back as well. He's a back hunter. So if you make a mistake against Chiesa on the mat, he will take you back and then it's just going to be an absolute nightmare from there. But on the flip side, Kevin Holland, I feel like he's going to have the striking advantage in this fight. I don't feel... Like he's going to have that much of a technical striking advantage because Chiesa, in my opinion, has really improved that striking. And we saw it from the Luque fight. Luque is supposed to have been the much better striker in that fight, but it's actually Chiesa landing good shots, busting him up early. And of course, a mistake from Chiesa on the mat led into the Darce choke from Luque, which is a bit of a specialty submission for him. But on the feet, Chiesa looked so good, so comfortable, relaxed, where... The advantage from Kevin Holland on the feet striking is going to be, I feel it's going to be within the speed and power. I feel Kevin Holland's got more power and again, the faster fighter on the feet, faster strikes, maybe a slightly quicker mover as well. So it's going to be a real good stylistic battle. Where I feel that the fight is going to take place is, look, obviously all fights start standing, so there is going to be some striking in the early moments, but Michael Chiesa always does a really good job of closing the distance. He knows what his game plan always is. He does usually execute it. I think he's got a takedown in every single fight that he's had in the UFC. I'd have to double check that, but if if not, it's, it's close. It might only be like... In fact, I think it's only one fight that he doesn't have a takedown, and that was the Kevin Lee fight. Kevin Lee took him down, Chiesa reversed and submitted, so... 
I think outside of that, he's had a takedown in every fight, so I kind of feel he's going to be able to close the distance against Holland. Again, you never know what you're going to get with Holland. Is he going to be a joker, Kevin Holland? Is he going to be, you know, sort of not messing around in the cage, but playful? And it's not the type of, well, it's not the the, the platform on the UFC in the brightest lights to be playful. You know, you need to be serious in there. And Kevin Holland can be serious and can look good. But again, you're just not sure what you're going to get. Whereas with Chiesa, I do feel you know exactly what you're going to get. You're going to get a, fo- a focus fighter that's looking to close the distance and get a takedown. The thing is with Kevin Holland as well, is when he does try and stand back up to his feet when he's taken down, he does show his back from time to time, which you can get away with against a certain level of opponent. But against Chiesa, who is a back hunter and a specialist grappler, you're not going to be able to get away with it with Chiesa. So look, there's every chance that Holland keeps this fight on the feet early, stands and strikes with Kayser or stuffs a couple of Kayser's initial takedowns and knocks him out afterwards. But I do kind of think that the long game's going to be in play here. Kayser's going to be able to get the takedowns and Holland's just going to be going to struggle off his back against Kayser. You look at Neil Magny, Neil Magny's got a good get-up game. He also shows his back when he gets up Neil Magny. But against Kayser, he knew he couldn't show his back and then he struggled to get up. So I kind of feel similar things might be in play here. For those reasons, I'm picking Michael Chiesa to win this fight. And in the next fight, this is going to be fireworks from a striking perspective. We've got Stephen Wonderboy Thompson versus Mihal Pereira. Now, Mihal Pereira is an absolute wild man for the most part. He has had fights where he's been a little calmer and he's been a little more composed and more technical. But like I say, this dude just loves to be exciting, explosive, powerful. And it's spin kicks, it's somersault kicks it's rolling thunders it's backflips into guard it's just all this crazy stuff that you don't see from any other fighter the thing is with Stephen Wonderboy Thompson the one thing I will mention straight away is in Wonderboy Thompson's career he will not have faced a striker like Pereira this will be something new for him and Pereira is not a fighter that you can bring somebody into your training camp and, and emulate from you know when you're sparring and trying to emulate your fighter to get a feel of what they're going to be like because Pereira just moves in such an unorthodox and awkward way but when all is said and done in this fight I think the better technical striking is with Stephen Thompson I think Wonderboy is going to be sort of on the bike a little bit I think he'll be moving backwards quite a lot especially in the early moments in this fight but Wonderboy can fight super well on the back foot like He can fight just as well moving backwards as he can moving forwards. His counter-striking is sharp, even with the hands. Like, obviously, we talk about the kicks with Wonderboy. He's got a plethora of different kicks, but even the hands are sharp. But his movement in and out of range is just unbelievable. Like, he's so good at what he does, striking on the feet. And I kind of feel that the longer this fight goes on, the more Pereira is going to start getting frustrated. He's going to start chasing him around the cage rather than cutting the cage off. He's going to be looping the the big bombs, the big overhands, the big hooks and throwing the big spin wheel kicks to the head in thin air. And I just feel like Thompson's going to get to a stage where he's very frustrating for Pereira. Pereira can't really close him down and hit him too much. And it's just going to bait Pereira into everything Thompson wants to bait him into from a striking perspective so I do think it's a really good fight stylistically for Thompson kind of on the flip side I feel like it's a very dangerous fight for him as well because obviously he is aging you know he's not getting any younger and if Pereira does land something hard that spin that hard spin wheel kick or that big hook to the jaw you know that could be all that she wrote but here in this fight I have to trust in my opinion the by far technical striker by far the fighter with more experience who's been in there with dangerous opponents and been there and seen it all and I just kind of feel that if Wonderboy does lose this fight it's going to be a slight mistake he makes or just the fact that he got caught by something big whilst moving backwards maybe he thought that you know his timing was on point just to evade a strike but that strike just catches the end of the jaw or behind the ear or something like that Unless a low percentage outcome happens for Pereira, I do think it's a good fight for Wonderboy. So for those reasons, I'm picking Stephen Wonderboy Thompson to win this fight. And in the next fight, we've got Derek the Black Beast Lewis versus Marcos Rogerio de Lima. And this is going to be an explosive fight in the heavyweight division. I'm not sure we're going to see the final bell. I think someone is going to get knocked out here. And... 
I think that Derek Lewis could potentially be relatively live in this fight because, look, spoiler alert, I'm not picking Derek Lewis to win, but what I'm saying is my argument for Lewis is Rogerio de Lima doesn't really move too well in regards to speed and lateral movement. He likes to plod forward with that Muay Thai stance that Muay Thai style that's very slow and static but stuck but having like a stalking approach so it's not as if Lewis is going to have to deal with a real good mover a, a mover that he's not going to be able to chase down and find the target on like Lewis is going to have opportunities to knock Dilema out now where I think Lewis is going to struggle though I think the volume's a little bit low I think he waits a little bit too much I think if Dilema's smart whilst Lewis is waiting for something to happen an opportunity to arise for Lewis to land a big shot on Delima. If Delima's chopping down the lead leg of Lewis, you know, that's gonna make Lewis even more slower. I think it's gonna make the volume drop even more for Lewis. And Delima could essentially just take this fight away from Lewis early just by breaking him down with the low kicks. Now if Delima comes into this fight and decides just to exchange punches hoping to land that one big bomb that knocks Lewis out, then you might as well just flip a coin for this fight because Lewis will exchange back with big punches and it's just going to be who lands that first punch clean and like I said at that point it's a coin flip it almost depends on how Delima fights if Delima comes into this fight smart uses a jab doesn't get into the exchanges early in this fight and just really chops Lewis down Lewis down from a leg kick perspective then I do think that Lima can make this fight look relatively easy it's just a big if like Delima does like his power he trusts his power and he loves going into the pocket to exchange punches. And that's where Derek Lewis is absolutely dangerous. So, yeah, it's a big if on what Delima is going to do in this in the cage. Is he going to be smart or is he going to be reckless? I am and I always have to side on where I think a fighter has got some serious strength. So I do think Delima can break Lewis down without Lewis even getting close to exchanging and landing something hard on Delima. And I do think Delima has got some power as well. So even if he did get into the exchange, there's still that chance, that coin flip chance of him landing that punch. So I think delima has got the two very slight paths to victories on the feet from a technical standpoint or that brawl. It's just the brawl is very risky. However, for those reasons that I mentioned, because Delima has got that technical advantage as well, I'm picking Marcos Rogerio Delima to win this fight. And in the next fight, we've got Trevin Giles versus Gabriel Bonfim. I think this is a bit of a mismatch, if I'm being honest. And look, I always hate to say this in the UFC. And, you know, that's no disrespect to the fighter that I'm not picking to win the fight, which, you know, I'm sure most people listening is going to understand that that's Trevin Giles at this point. So, look, Trevin Giles is a UFC caliber fighter. So, technically, as a UFC caliber fighter, you should be able to be going in there with any UFC fighter. And that's just the way it is. But... Even with that being said, I think Bonfim is, again, a mismatch for Giles. I think Bonfim is going to be the better striker. I think he's the better wrestler. He's the better grappler. He's got more finishing upside. If the fight goes to a decision, it's more likely to be Bonfim as well. I think he's more durable. He's going to be bigger. He's going to be stronger. He's going to be more powerful, more physical. I just, I really don't see a way that Trevin Giles wins this fight outside of that puncher's chance, which every single fighter at this level in the UFC wearing four-ounce gloves has a legit puncher's chance. If Trevin Giles lands that one punch that hits Bonfim and knocks him out, and look, if if you're going to give Bonfim one weakness or analyse one weakness or one hole or one flaw in his game, it is probably the striking defence. Like, he can leave his chin a little bit to be hit sometimes, but the fact that he's so fast and so technical with his boxing and his striking, he can get away with leaving his chin open a little bit for most of the time again when he comes further down the line and he's fighting much higher level of competition where you've got serious strikers with serious knockout power in the division then you know it's going to be a little bit of a different story but for Trevin Giles he, he's not really you know he's not really known for having that one punch knockout power and I just don't see it landing and if he does I just don't think he's going to knock Bonfim out it's just for me that's Trevin Giles's main path to victory the puncher's chance outside of that like I said I think Bonfim's better everywhere technically from a skill set perspective all the disciplines in MMA and then he's got the physical advantages as well so yeah it's a tough fight in my opinion for Trevin Giles and picking Gabriel Bonfim to win this fight and in the next fight we could have another explosive fight here as well we've got Roman Kopilov versus Claudio Hibero 
Roman Kopilov has proven a lot of people wrong over his last couple of fights. He's really, it seems that he's really turned the corner a little bit. He's winning fights where people have been expecting him to lose, where the bookies have been expecting him to lose, and he's finishing fights as well. So, look, Roman Kopilov, when he came into the UFC, known as a low-volume striker, really didn't do too much else. Again, just looked to pitter-patter with his strikes and try and just point fight and hope that he pulls away from his opponents but again it was always going to be tough when you're not throwing or landing that many strikes but like I said over his last couple of fights it does seem that we've got some improvement from Kopilov and he's looked a lot better now from Claudio Hibero's perspective like Hibero is a very explosive powerful fighter loves to strike hard low kick power in both hands he's a really dangerous fighter and I feel like in most of Hibero's fights he's going to have that finishing upside just for the because of the power that he possesses now against Abdul Razak Al-Hassan first of all that's a tough UFC debut because Al-Hassan's actually a decent fighter but also it was one of those coin flip types of fights because for as powerful and explosive as Hibero is Al-Hassan is exactly the same as well so at some point some, one of them was going to drop Al-Hassan did try to wrestle early on didn't do an amazing job, it was okay, but eventually Al-Hassan got the fight on the feet and he did get Hibero eventually, but it was always going to happen, one of them was going to get the other one, it's just how the fight was going to go, and then in the second fight in the UFC against Joseph Holmes, like, look, it's questionable whether Holmes is a UFC caliber fighter, he does have some skills, but it's the way Hibero won, he, you know, he was doing a great job on the feet, he defended some takedowns from Holmes, who does have a decent submission game, and then he reversed positions, then he was the one wrestling Holmes, doing really good work on top, and you can see Hibero is a young fighter that is improving from fight to fight, he's still developing, so this fight with Kopilov is going to be a really good fight, I kind of feel like Kopilov is going to be technical here, he's going to try and use his fundamental strikes to break, to break Claudio Hibero down, but Hibero for me, I think he's going to be able to walk through the shots of Kopilov, I think he's going to land hard low kicks, I think he's going to sting Kopilov with some hard shots, Maybe some hesitancy sets in from Kopilov after he feels that. But I'd, ultimately, I just think it's a really close fight. If the fight goes late, Claudio Hibero's gas tank is a little questionable. But you look at Ro Roman Kopilov's last two fights, you know, round two against Punelli Soriano. He had his hands on his hips, breathing heavy. heavy. In round three of the fight before that, hand on the hips, breathing heavy. So it's not as if Kopilov is a fighter that will fight in round three as he does in round one. I just feel it's either going to be a complete masterclass from Roman Coppola from a technical perspective or Claudio Ibero is just going to show him no respect, get into the face, land hard shots, rip to the body head and knock him out. So it's which side do you want to pick out of those two? And I kind of... I am kind of siding with Claudio Hibero here because I do like the way that he overwhelms his opponents with the power, with the aggression and the pressure. So for those reasons, I'm picking Claudio Hibero to win this fight. And in the next fight, we've got another real close fight. In my opinion, we've got CJ Vergara versus Venetia Salvador. Now, again, this is a fight that's going to be Vergara, who I feel is going to be the more technical fighter, and Salvador, who is... The forward pressure, aggressive Brazilian, just like I've just said with Claudio Ribeiro, which will come forwards, look to land and wing big bombs, hard low kicks, rip to the body, rip to the head, and just really overwhelm the opponent with, again, that aggression and forward pressure. Like, I feel that, again, we've got this this style. I mean, I don't think Vergara is like this super technical striker, but I do think he's the more technical striker out of the two. It's just in a fight that's likely to be... Real fast-paced, real fun, real wild, with power being thrown. It kind of, technique kind of can get thrown out the window in that type of fight. And that type of fight, in my opinion, does suit Salvador a little bit better. If there's wrestling and grappling, I could see both sides of the coin here. I could see Vergara scoring some takedowns and a little bit of top control. And I can see Venezia Salvador hitting one of the trips that he likes, getting on top of Vergara and landing or having some good top control time on top of Vergara. But ultimately, the wrestling and grappling, I think they've both got decent get-up games. I don't think there's the grappling and the top time is going to play that much of a factor. I think it's going to be won and lost on the feet. I think Vergara is going to score the slightly better put-together strikes, but I think Salvador is going to be the one that's looking to take his head off the entire time. So, yeah, a real close and competitive fight. But like I say, in a fight that I do believe is going to be wild and fast-paced and super fun, ultra-wild, that 
in my opinion, does suit Salvador a little bit better. So for those reasons, I'm picking Vinicius Salvador to win this fight. And in the next fight, we've got Jake Matthews versus Darius Flowers making his UFC debut finally. Jake Matthews was supposed to fight... Miguel Baeza, Baeza's pulled out with an injury, and Darius Flowers finally steps in to make his UFC debut. He was supposed to make his debut earlier this year, I believe, but he was serving a six-month suspension from USADA for, you know, banned substances, the exact substance, and if it was legit in regards to he knew he was taking it or not, or was it tainted, a tainted supplement, I've got no idea, but, you know, he's coming off that six-month suspension, I kind of don't feel that it's going to make too much of a difference in regards to the Darius Flowers that we've seen in tape or that I've at least seen in tape. But Darius Flowers is a real interesting fighter. Now, I feel that if this was a full camp for Flowers and he was fighting more of a fighter around his an entry level in the UFC, around his own level, then he's going to be super dangerous and super difficult to beat. Now, although I think Jake Matthews is beatable, and I think if Flowers does beat Matthews, I'm not going to be overly shocked I just feel on short notice, fighting a fighter like Matthews, who's been in there for many, many years at the highest level, fighting real solid competition, beating some of them, losing some of them, but being competitive throughout, I do think it might be a little bit too much too soon for Flowers. Look, Matthews is good everywhere. He's a good striker, good wrestler, good grappler, and... Flowers is very much the same. He's got heavy hands. His boxing's good. Hard uppercuts. He's also got explosive takedowns. When he sits on top of his opponents, he is super, super heavy. But I don't think that if he does take Matthews down, it's going to be easier. I think he'll expend energy doing it. And I don't think Matthews is going to be stuck under him. I think Matthews could get back up to the feet. And then if the fight, if a fighter is scoring takedowns and getting more top control, I feel like that's more likely to be Matthews. I think Matthews is probably got the slightly better fight IQ with a slightly more technical ability in regards to the striking as well so I think it's a fight that Matthews has in the bag here should he fight smart and not rush anything and you know make his reads and mind his p's and q's of the danger that's coming back on flowers but make no mistake about it Darius Flowers in my opinion is going to win fights in the UFC I do think he's going to be a bit of a problem when he starts picking up some momentum and some consistency and get some wins under his belt but for right now in this specific fight against this specific opponent on short notice I'm going to be picking Jake Matthews to win this fight and in the next fight we've got Miranda Maverick versus Priscilla Cachoeira and Cachoeira is supposed to fight Joanne Wood it's Miranda Maverick stepping in and unfortunately for Cachoeira I think She's got a fight here with a harder opponent than her original opponent. The one thing that's going to side very slightly with Cachoeira is the fact that this is short notice for Miranda Maverick. But again, I don't think Miranda Maverick is the type of fighter that's ever ever out of the gym or out of shape. I think she's probably always going to be ready and prepared to go. She does strike me as that type of fighter. And like I said, I do think that she's a better fighter than or a harder fight for Cachoeira than Joanne Wood. So... Look, Cachoeira is striking that, that zombie-like approach where she'll come forwards, hands down, eat punches to land punches. You know, that's where she's good. I just don't think that she's going to be able to have that type of fight against Maverick. And if she tries, I think Maverick's just going to close the distance. Well, Cachoeira will be closing the distance for Maverick. I think Maverick will just stand the ground, not move backwards, so that distance is closed, be able to get a body lock, take her down, or hit her with a double leg and get on top of her and do really good work. And that's where Maverick has got a huge gap in skill in this fight. I think the wrestling and grappling of Maverick is going to be too much for Cachoeira. And Cachoeira is going to have to catch... Miranda Maverick early I think with something hard to wobble her and change the course of the fight to be able to you know win this fight whether that be getting the knockout on that wobble and knockdown or hurting Maverick or just taking the fight to her therefore after having hesitancy setting on Maverick but I just feel that all that I've just explained is such a low percentage outcome. I don't think it's probable. I think it's more likely that Maverick's the better technical striker that lands the slightly harder punches, that's able to get the wrestling going, gra top side grappling going. I do think Maverick's got the finishing upside. I do think she's got the upside should it go to the scorecards as well. So for those reasons, I'm picking Miranda Maverick to win this fight. And in the next fight, we've got Matthew Semmelsberger fighting Joros Medic, who's stepping in on short notice. It's supposed to have been Semmelsberger versus 
Johan Leoness, but Leoness has pulled out and Medic has stepped in and look, credit to Medic stepping in because we've not seen him for a while, or at least it feels like we haven't seen him for a while and he's a dangerous fighter, especially on the feet striking. It's just with Semmelsberger, I kind of feel that Semmelsberger is going to be the more dangerous striker, so where Joros Medic is going to be strongest... I think that Semmelsberger is going to be better in that area than Medic, and it's a difficult fight for Medic, this one, in my opinion, because, look, we saw what Semmelsberger did last time out to Jeremiah Wells. Jeremiah Wells was getting hurt hard in that fight. Like, the power that Semmelsberger possesses is absolutely legit. It is really, really legit. So, look, like, Medic has got that touch of death type of striking where it doesn't look like he packs too much power. It's real deceptive power, and he's able to drop his opponents. It wouldn't shock me for him to drop Semmelsberger and knock him out. It's just, I feel like Semmelsberger's more aggressive, more overwhelming, and has got more raw power in his strikes than what Medic has. And when it comes to the wrestling and grappling, I feel like Medic can be got at here with Semmelsberger. Although Semmelsberger was taken down and controlled in a big way against Wells. Wells is a high-level black belt in jiu-jitsu. And Semmelsberger didn't do a bad job of initially trying to get back to his feet and then he would get taken down again. Joros Medic just doesn't have the wrestling or the grappling qualities that Jeremiah Wells has. And actually, Matthew Semmelsberger, in my opinion, has got the striking and grappling advantage against Medic. And then on the feet, I feel that... Medic might be the better technical striker, but Samuelsberg is more aggressive with more power. So it's a hard fight for Medic, in my opinion. Like, I'm not ruling him out, and I don't think he's a bad underdog play. But on short notice, in a fight where there's obvious disadvantages, especially within the grappling and the wrestling, I do feel like if Samuelsberger mixes things up and fights smart here, he's going to be able to do real good work. So for those reasons, I'm picking Matthew Samuelsberger to win this fight and that's all for this episode of the podcast i'm super stoked about this card i really am i said it at the start in the introduction i really really cannot wait for saturday night it's probably one of my favorite cards that i've been looking forward to for the entire year serious serious fights the baddest motherfucker title with dustin Poirier and just engage you rematch i can't wait i hope all you guys enjoy the event i hope everybody tuning into this podcast has enjoyed the show and enjoyed the breakdowns and if i've helped then with your analysis or if i've helped you win a bet or cash a bet whatever then please hit the like please hit the subscribe button it really does help the channel and again if you are betting, I hope you crush the bookies unless you're betting against the fighters I'm betting. Then I obviously hope that you lose, respectively, of course. But yeah, look, if you disagree with any of my picks or you know, you've know you got some thoughts of your own, drop them in the comments if you're listening to this, obviously, on YouTube. We are available on Spotify, on Apple Music, Amazon Music, all the podcast platforms. So yeah, if you're listening to this on YouTube and you want to drop a comment, let me know how you're analysis goes for this card how you feel the fights are going to go down please do i'll always try and get back to the comments throughout the week when i can and it is me that responds when a response is made on youtube so without going on too much longer thank you for tuning in i'm newsome enjoy the fights enjoy the baddest motherfucker championship title and i'll see you again next week